let's begin our Sunday school with, with prayer. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with such a bountiful earth, such a strong gifts from your hand each and every day. And yet we are cursed that inside of us we are never really happy with what we have. We need a little more to be content. Help us to see the sad insights of our hearts and also the level of contentment that you and your gospel promises can only provide. In Jesus our Savior. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I, uh, I, I'm excited to teach this and also a little fearful to talk about the subject of coveting because coveting... That is something that our world and our economy really runs on. You look at that first question. I asked you, what is the purpose of advertising? And if you would sum up all advertising, mobile, print, everything else, what is the purpose of every advertisement you see or hear or are told? The purpose of Bill? To get your money. Get my money? Yeah, and, and how do they get my money? They don't just say, give me money. What is the... What is the psychology behind that, Jim? To get you to buy their product. Yeah, my product, right? You have so many others. I want you to buy my product. Why my, Cheryl? Because you need it. I need that, right? <laughs> yeah. I need this product. So the entire psychology of advertising is to not be content. What I currently have is not good enough. I, I, I must have this and that. I must upgrade. I must get a premium membership, premium this, that. But the entire psychology of advertising is to not be content. <laughs> okay? And then today, we talk about coveting. What is this entire, entire uh, psychology of coveting? Not giving. Yep, not giving. There, there it is. I, I kind of scrooge. I hold on to it. More. More. The, the entire idea of coveting is not be content. Um, when you teach this to 6th, 7th, and 8th graders and you say, what is coveting? They look at you with blank stares. They're Americans. They're good, smart Americans. And so they believe that sh dreaming high and shooting for the stars is just good psychology. You deserve. You earn. You must have. And when you speak to them at, at a basic level, that coveting is not being content with what I have, you have this, this massive friction inside of me. Because at some level, I want to, I want more. I know I shouldn't, but I want more. And then at some level, I know the preacher's right, I just don't want to agree with him. Coveting in the Ninth and Tenth Commandment is a sin that you and I are, are steeped in, in our culture. Because every advertisement, at some level, connects me with the basic of covenant. I'm not saying that advertisements themselves are sins and people in marketing departments are spawns of Satan. That's not what I'm, not what I'm saying at all. Some might be, but, but my point in this is to say we have to recognize the culture we live in. The culture we live in, I, I am being advertised at constantly with the goal that I will never be content. That, that is its ultimate present goal. And for me to say, now, in one hour, I'm going to study something that for the last 100 or so hours of the week, I have been told the exact opposite. Um, there, there is a challenge for us today in, in recognizing how, how countercultural we have to be with the stress of our society. Any thoughts that you have as we get going here? Thoughts on the prevalence of advertising, thoughts on the difficulty of coveting. I see a lot of thoughtful looks as I look out among you. Thoughts so far? I have a thought. You do? Ken, thank you. I'm going to grab a sheet, but please keep speaking. In your prayer, you use the word, have a little more. I, I disagree with that. You disagree with my prayer, okay. I think it's a lot more. Yeah. It starts off a little, but I'm never satisfied with little. I never could just have a little improvement. Right. I agree. Thanks for your correction. Gentle correction. Did I see someone else over here? B, please. Is there not a difference between being 
not content with what you have, but want to better. Yeah. See, there, there is, there is the finest of lines, right? And and there is a difference, and we will find it. But my my preface to you and, and to my own heart is that is a line that we blur constantly. Well, I agree. Yeah. But, I mean, there is a there is a difference. There is a difference. If I can only find it, it's like finding the line on there. If I can only find the very narrow line on which to walk, where I don't go into uh, complete coveting, and I don't go into just being lazy and who cares? I don't need to wash my clothes. You know, the very narrow line to walk here. That tightrope is very thin. And I agree we have to get at that, but first, it, at least in my opinion, and I, I, I believe most would agree, we are so influenced to covet that that is such a prevalence in us today. You almost have to kind of blow back the other way. But yeah, the ultimate goal on the back of page two is to say, how can I, and don't turn there, but, but, but how can I want better while being content and not coveting? Be a challenge. Hopefully, we'll achieve it in, in an hour. Ken? We continue being bombarded. You turn on the TV, you get nine commercials before the program. Comes. Right. Then the program is on for five minutes, and you get nine more commercials. Right. That's why you record everything in six. <laughs> <laughs> right. We turn, we turn on the football game Thursday night. Somebody scores a touchdown, and I count six commercials between the touchdown and the next kickoff. And I think, wow. Yeah, that's our, we, we are so being advertised more and more. And that's what that's all about. Not being content. You need one of these. I need this. It make you a better person. Make you happy. There it is. Uh, happiness. Uh, yeah. it, that will give me what I really want, please. And think about how much the like the companies are spending, like like Super Bowl, for instance, like the millions of dollars they do for like that thirty second slot just to advertise to you. To, you know, hey, you know, you need this, like, you know, just that mindset of, I will put in millions of dollars because I know, if, like, I can get people to buy this product because I have a funny ad. What What do companies spend more on? Research and development or marketing? Marketing. <laughs> it's not that I have a good product, it's that you want my product over everything else. Yeah. Steve, please, and then share. Go ahead. Share, please. I'm real disappointed this you know, we all have cable TV, or a lot of us do. And uh, my 300 channels or something that I have, sure. I started flipping through them, and now you see one TV sales program. Now there's probably 15 different. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. Buy your jewelry here, buy this gloves here, buy your shoes there, buy your jewelry. I mean, it's, it's real discouraging. I'm paying a lot of money to watch. Sure. Walking advertisements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No wonder FedEx is doing so well. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, please, and then John. So maybe this is an offshoot of uh, these questions, and I haven't looked at the second page, but I am. Thank you. I'm really, I'm really curious to see, you know, what we're gonna, what we're gonna see, what God's word is gonna tell us, what you're gonna share with us, because right away I think back to when I was a student, um, noodles. All right, this is just how it was, and then you know, if, if, if that was meat, it was tuna. <laughs> In a can. All right. And then you work your way up to once a week you get hamburger. Right? So at what point do we go beyond, you know, tuna is enough, or I can survive on noodles. Um, we can we can survive on bread and water. But at what point do we cross that line? It's like, ooh, meat, filet mignon. Right? I'm not around. And the point is, yeah. I'm curious to see where it's done. And how, how you're going to walk that tightrope. It, it is a tightrope. Because okay. is it wrong to have saying, hamburger yeah. when I could get by with noodles? Yeah, we, in our reaction to, and here's where I think a lot of people fail in the Ninth and Tenth Commandment, we react to an over advertised society by making new laws on how holy people are to live. Holy people do not buy. T-bones. They may, they may buy chopstick, but they don't buy T-bones. And we start setting up artificial rules. And I think, I think it, God, it's way smarter than me, and I can only marvel a little bit at his majesty. But, but when I see the tightrope God has set, he doesn't say certain this or that are sinful. He really gets to the heart. Am I content with what God has given me? 
or am I always demanding more? And if my contentment at this time is this or that, that is something different than saying, well, I know the Lord has provided a delicious meal of ramen noodles and graham crackers for me, but my heart is set on steak and lobster. Um, so yeah, so there, it's so much a matter of heart issue that you'll find, especially if you get to page two, it's really not about me telling you rules or God telling you rules. It's really investigating my own heart Am I content with what God has blessed me, and or am I not? So, yeah, it's an, ex an excellent point, and a, and a scary one that we do well to make sure I don't set up this kind of meat, these kind of priorities. If you have this kind of car, it's okay. That kind of car is sinful. We have, we, you, you should say, wait, hey, wait a second, Pastor. You have no Bible passage to tell me that. So, Bill. Didn't the Bible passage say something about covet your neighbor's wife and so on? Yes. And this way before advertisement took hold, they're still going on because of the like coveting a neighbor's wife or his money or whatever. There's always a central heart or animals or whatever. Right. But uh, you're, but nowadays we're so over overwhelmed with the advertisement part that it's like I don't know if it's even worse than back then, but it seems like it is. With all the extra people or extra information we get. Yeah. <clears throat> Child today has grown up on a smartphone that is constantly advertising to him and her as they watch their YouTube videos. Constant Instagram and YouTube influencers telling them things to buy. So much more at a young age that lasts their lifetime. This constant desire that if you have this product, these people are happy, you should buy them. Yeah, it, it, uh, the temptation has always been present. It's just being stoked quite hot today with, that, with our advertisements. It's not just an advertisement, it's product placement in yeah. shows. Yeah. Oh, look what they're drinking. They, uh, it's, it's a Coke, you know, not a Pepsi or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah, people pay a lot of money for that. It's brand. Brand is being advertised a lot. I remember as a kid when we went to, you know, get school stuff. It wasn't we needed Nike or, or Adidas or whatever. We got shoes. That was it, you know. Pure and simple, where now it's I can't go to school without my Nikes. I can't do this. I can't do that. I need this. I need this book bag. The, the pressure to that. We're gonna. I, I see five more hands come up to that. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna say thank you. I want to get into the Bible study, but I will say this is an outgrowth. We are constantly being advertised, told that you will be happy if you have this product, this service, this mentality. So today is a little bit of a pushback to say, how can I be content with what is God has given and, and struggle against my desires that I'm not content with this, I must have that. So thank you for your hands. I want to get into the Bible study because I, I think we're seeing the infection of our society. Let's try to see some of the, a little bit of the solution here. Uh, Paul speaks in Romans chapter 7. This is, a, this is a great insight into the human heart that Martin Luther would like to use, and I, I should use more. Um, Romans chapter 7, verses 7 to 8. For I would not have known what coveting really was, if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandments, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. This is a, a deep theological store of my sinful heart. Can you, can you summarize what he's saying about how we respond to a commandment? If the commandment says, do not do this, what is the human response when God says, do not do? Wet paint, do not touch. Hold on, I'm trying to make eye contact. Emily, thank you for making eye contact. <laughs> Emily, we stand in this room for years. Emily, the law says do not do. What do we want to do, Emily? Why? When Dad says do not do this, or, or Mom says do not do this, or school says, why do we want to do what we're told not to do? Because it's just tempting to do it. Yes, it's tempting me. And what's the other part that's inherent in me when somebody says no? We like to praise this in our American uh, culture. What's the other part in me? Someone says no, sure. I'm going to do it because? I said I couldn't do that. Ah, you told me no, I'll dare you, right? I will do it just because you said no. That kind of 
teenage sorry, that teenage rebelliousness that really we, we never outgrow. I'm, I'm not picking on you, Emily. There's still, if somebody says, do not do this, there's a part of me that says, I want to do it just to show you I can't, right? How many videos on this? No, everyone said he could never achieve this. Look at how, how much weight he has lost, or how much money he has saved, or all this stuff. You tell me no, I'm going to prove you wrong. That's this, that's this passage. God says no, I'm going to prove who wrong? <laughs> God wrong, by how sinful I am. That's, there it is. God says, don't be content, don't desire what you don't have. And I say, do you want that? I'm, I'm going to desire the opposite. So here we see a little bit of the sinful heart uh, in that. Uh, be please. Well, it's also that unless it, we're told it's a sin, maybe we don't know it's a sin. Yeah. You know, if... Unless we are told, do not desire this, do not want this, see the difference. If the only one teaching us about desires and wants are our culture, <clears throat> that we're going to have the massive debt, we're going to talk about this in the financial piece, we have the massive debt of any nation in the entire world. We have more debt now than any time before. Why? Because I believe the ads. I need more. At some moment. Th thank you, B. That's a, an excellent point. Uh, number two, why is it so hard for us to grasp that coveting is a sin? Yes, Aaron? I mean, it's it's hard to comprehend be like, well, why is it a sin for me to, I, I just want this. I just want this. Like, there's, what's wrong with that? If I, if Are you I telling me hard, no, Pastor? <laughs> if, it, if I work hard for my money, I, I should be able to buy that. But then they come out with something new, and I'm like, oh, I really want that. Yeah. I, I want the new one. Right. And then it's like every year there's something newer and newer, you know, cars for instance. Oh, I just got this car. Oh, but the 2019 is going to come out. And I, I really want that. And it's like yeah, you keep going and friend. keep going and then you're just going to stay in debt. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so just to summarize what you said, the reason it's hard for me to grasp this as a sin is because I always want... I just want, I want the nice stuff. I want the newer ones. And always a little bit of an improvement, Steve, and then John. Yeah. Um, what do you do now? What What is your job? I work in a uh, car rental. <laughs> That's why I'm thinking about cars. Yeah. <laughs> Are you? Do you really? Hmm? Didn't you used to do? Um, I was a restaurant manager before. Manager. That. Yep. Because didn't you start out as a server? Yeah, I started out. Basically, I was 16. I was a host, and I just kept moving up. And that's, I think that's the answer to the question because society says if you work just a little bit harder, you can move up. Yeah. And you ended up at manager level, mm -hmm. starting out down here. Yeah. They didn't give you that because like, hey, Aaron's pretty lazy. Go ahead and, and yeah. you know, hire the yeah. No, it's because he was not content with his current station. And it wasn't sinful moving up by any means. Yeah. He worked hard and proved himself. And that's, I think, the struggle that we face as Christians is <clears throat> what is my motivation? Do I want to be the CEO of the barbecue corporation? Okay, and you know I'm going to have to be maybe a little bit sinful along the way to, to achieve that level, uh, or maybe I just want to move up to manager level. Right. So I think that's something that we struggle with all the time. Our work is telling us the better you do, the more you're going to get. Right, and, and I'm incentivized toward greed because I have a better job, better promotion, whatever. This challenge for any worker or anyone searching for a job is to say, I am content with my current station, I am thankful for it, but I would like not to get more money, not to be richer or more popular, I would like to use the talents God has given me in greater service to my company. I, I would like to be a better humble servant. Not, not I, I want more glory, I would, want, I would want to be a bigger servant. And, and maybe in this position as a manager or whatever, I can be a better servant. See, there, there's a the rub. If I want it for greed and I want it for glory, then it doesn't matter what my job is. It's wrong. If I want it to be a humble servant of the talents he's given me, 
then I can be the humblest servant in the most menial job, as Luther said. The, the, the janitors and the men that clean out the stalls, they are more servanthood than the police and all these other things because they are thankful in their jobs. They appreciate the gifts. So there it is. Why do I want the promotion? Why do I want the title? Why do I want the job? Is it service or is it glory? And <laughs> I, I, I can say as I reflect on my life and my jobs uh, before becoming a, a servant, of the called servant of the gospel, that I want promotions because I wanted to be a better servant or I wanted $2 more an hour. I wanted my own truck, not somebody else's truck. Oh, yeah. So, so I, that, that's a hard thing to, to want it for the right reasons. Uh, John, I think, and then uh, Ken. Dave Rangers says, I'm oh. sorry, yep. I suffer from H1N1 virus. Yeah. I have one, but I need one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Interesting. <laughs> it's still going around, isn't it? Ken? I have said this before, but one of the primary sentences that has always jumped out to me is uh, says our primary purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God mm -hmm. and the people about us. Now, <clears throat> what is maximum service? I think it goes back to what he was talking about. I can have maximum service by educating myself by going up the ladder. Sure. Like my grandmother used to say, some my grandfather did something about it. he would say, uh, money is the root of all evil. And she said, no. The love of money is the root of all evil. And I think that concept there is what answers a lot of questions because once you put money above God and what his principles are, it's not wrong <coughs> to have money. It's what where you put the priorities back in the day. <laughs> oh, as soon as you do one, man, you, go, you brought five, right? Yeah, so that, it's, <laughs> yeah right? I mean, the, the first, well, how many commandments should I keep, Lord? Well, I can't keep the first, actually. I can't keep two through ten either. So, yeah, no, that, how quickly, again, this is the hard issue. We, we have to be very careful about making rules artificial. It really much is my heart. Do I want this because I am content and I want to be a better servant? And I want to provide for my family, or do I want this because I want the glory, and I want the leather seats of the 2019, or whatever it is, you know? Um, so yeah, there, there is my challenge. We are not being called to ascetic life, to be monks that live in barrels all day, like a certain group of people did for 400 years. That's how they took this commandment. We just must be barrel monks. It doesn't seem like a lot of fun, but... <laughs> We're gonna keep going. <laughs> John saw an opening. Uh, let's go to James chapter four, verses two. The first first half of this. Um, you want something but don't get it. You covet, but you cannot have what you want. So how would we define coveting according to James Romans seven? and James 4. I think there's two principal components to coveting. Can, can you give me e either Romans or the one from James, please? How we identify, is this a covetous desire or not? Aaron, please. It's like you have something, I want it, but you own it. I'm not even like, like just cattle, for instance. If you have a, like if you have great cattle, but mine's, you know, not as fed or what have you. I mean, I wish I had that, but I, I, I won't have that guy. That's his. I, I can't have it, but I want it. I can't have it. And, and I think someone mentioned neighbor's wife. There's a perfect example. I cannot have that woman. That woman is not for me. That is for my neighbor. But oh man, would my life be better if I had her instead of my current bride? You know, how, how sinful I think. I, I want what I can't have. That somebody else's, someone else's means, someone else's blessings. I want their life. If I only had their life, then I would. I, I can't have their life. I can't be them. Um, so I want what I can't have. And what's the other part of coveting, according to these passages? B, please. Because I don't get what I want. This, this cycle of discontent. I can't have something, and I don't get what I wanted. Ah! Because, of course, if I don't get it, I'm not content with what I have. Been given. Um, 
So here, it really, really is cyclical thing. I am not content because I can't have what I want and I don't get what I want. And, 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 and notice how, how generic our Lord and Savior is. He does not say it's a sin to want this trim line or to want this house or this many square feet. He, he in very general terms, says, look deeply into your heart, dear Christian. Is it either of these things? The object, cattle, neighbor's wife, whatever, the object will always change. But the desire of your heart, is that a wholesome or an unwholesome desire? Jim? I read the next verse in that passage, and I think this is important too. Um, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Yeah, the motive. That's so important, right? The, the inner the inner drive of yeah. my heart. My heart wants this. Well, how come God doesn't give it to me? Because you want the wrong way. It, I want in selfishness. I want in greed. I want in keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah. It continues to say that, that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's to the heart of it. I want more money for me, not for others. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jim. Aaron. Uh, all right. Not Aaron. <laughs> Luke, please. <laughs> it's funny, though, too. Even when you get what you want, it's not enough. Now you want more. You, it continues. It never ends. Mm -hmm. What's the stop? There is none. There's none. If I don't put the self-governing stop on my own covetousness, I am never satisfied. I was, well, I was reading Latin poetry on Friday, as I'm sure all of you want to do. And then, yeah, right, let's get together. And uh, the, the irony of it is there's this Latin poet by the name of Ovid, and he, and he, has, he, has, the, he has all these writings, and he has this couplet, kind of like the Proverbs, you know, if this, then this, is, he's kind of the master of that. And he has this, this famous co uh, couplet on coveting. This is the guy, how many years ago? This is the guy during the Romans and all the difficulties and the excesses of this world. And here's a man who just sits back as a, as a humble poet and looks and, and says very much what Luke just said. Luke obviously has been reading Latin poetry in his spare time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and has said, if you always want, you will never have enough. And, and, and there is no stop on that. And, and how a man watched the decline of one of the most prosperous nations because he identified it ruled by covetousness. And how many people and how many nations have fallen because it is not enough for me to have this. Not enough for me to have Europe. I gotta have Russia, said Hitler. You know, it's not enough for me to have this. Not enough for me to have Italy, Mussolini said. I wanna get a little bit more of the Mediterranean. You know, how, how much I have to have and I am defeated because I don't get it. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Cheryl, please. But to go on the opposite side of sure. that, okay, you get, you go out and you get that new car that you want. Because people say, oh, we, we'll give you credit. You can have this. You want it. And then how many times do you do that and then turn around and regret it? Why did I do that? I really can't afford to make that monthly payment. I can't. I shouldn't have done it. But... And a summer job offered to be a used car salesman. Mm -hmm. I could have made a lot of money. But I really struggled with the ethical value of a man studying to be ministry who makes more and more money on hoodwinking people. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't do it. I, I, took, I took a job teaching kids how to drive cars, the best driver said. <laughs> so I, I, I lost money but gained gray hair. But um, how much my heart said, oh, I have. And I'm not trying to pick on used car salesmen. I'm just saying, as I evaluated and went through their training and looked at that, I said, the entire principle of this particular dealership, not all of them, the entire principle of this dealership is to get people focused on the maximum they can get in and the maximum we can get out of them. Not on needs, but on covetousness. And I, I couldn't do that for a summer, but to my shame, I wanted to. Question four, give me an example from your life. I guess I just gave you one from mine. Uh, an example of our covetousness in our life. Uh, we can talk about wanting another man's cattle, but not many of us have cattle anymore. Um, can you think of an example, a short story, 
I, I, I coveted something I couldn't have. I coveted something I didn't get, and how frustrated I was that I didn't get this. Yeah. Aaron? I mean, just for me personally, I know I struggle with this. You know, I live in an apartment, and I'm always like, man, if I just had a house, like, you know, I wouldn't have neighbors above me. I would, I, it would just be me. And just, you know, just that mindset, you know, and I'm like, you know, I just have to start saving, and I, I can get my own house, and then I'll be happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody wants the house yeah. that it only starts. Yeah. <laughs> and you're broke. Yeah. yeah. You start renovating, and oh boy. Thank you, thank you, Aaron. We've all thought that. If I just have a little bit more square footage, I'll have happiness. Or some square footage. You know. Another example? Yes, sir. Well, uh, years ago when I was working, uh, one of the things I, I was a brakeman actually on the railroad. And I wanted to become a conductor. Well, I tried taking the test, and I missed it. And uh, I was really blue for a while. And then I got to thinking about it. And then I got to seeing what they actually did as a conductor, what responsibilities were and everything. I was so glad that I didn't get that. You know, but at the time, I was really like, oh, man, I sure wish I had this job. It paid better, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it just something I was thought I could probably do in handle and all that kind of stuff. But really and truly, the good Lord was looking out for me. And I, to this day, I'm happy I never got that. How many country songs are like that? Yeah, I wanted this girl later on in life. I'm thankful I didn't get that girl. Yeah. <laughs> Hypothetically, there could be a couple that way, Nora. There's a lot of songs. There's some old, there's some, you, you and I could say some old German uh, tunes along those same lines, some polka, polka songs. Uh, along that line. I wanted it and then I'm thankful I didn't get it. But I was blue because I didn't get it at the time. Yeah, let's, let's keep going. Thank you for sharing your stories. I'm sure all of us can think of at least one time or maybe current time now. Psalm 10 is a, an interesting description of a covetous person. And uh, I'm going to read this and look at the seven different ways God defines a covetous man. In his arrogance, the wicked man boasts of the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. Take, take a moment with your pen in front of you or your pencil to circle the seven descriptions of a covetous man, covetous person, and uh, maybe highlight or star the one that stands out to you, that's surprising, that's um, concerning that you see in yourself or in others, uh, what of the seven really gets you? find six and having a hard time finding the seventh, that's by design. The seventh, I think, the description here is, we don't usually think of this verb as a sin, so to speak. I think it shouldn't, it really shouldn't be. Uh -huh. But for this man it is. In 15 more seconds, circle your seventh and highlight one that really uh, surprises, convicts, indicts you. See if we can find the seven. What's the first one? Uh, go, going from left to right across your screen. First one, Sharon. Arrogance. Yeah, arrogance is, is in it. A very off-putting quality. I can tell if a person's arrogant, it seeps through their pores. And so a covetous man has an arrogance about him. The next one, John? Wicked. Wicked. Yeah, this, this eternal character of wickedness. This is how I am. Not just I look wicked or I dress up wicked like for the musical. I am actually wicked inside. All right, next one after that, Mark. Cravings. Cravings, yeah, he craves of stuff, right. There's one right before that, but cravings. Boast. Boast, yeah, look, look, at, look at my wickedness. I boast of, of who I am, right? 
Um, it, it, I don't know if you've noticed, but in the last nine months, the word binge, which previously was a, was a negative thing, binge eating, binge drinking, binge everything, now I am encouraged in advertisements to binge on my Netflix and to binge on my shows. And now cravings and bingings are used as a positive verb when they should not be. So thank you, Martin. You've got two. We've got arrogance and wicked. We've got boasting and cravings. What's the next one? Matthew? Oh, well, oh, it would be great, I think. The next one on the list. I just wanted to, I wanted to go back and talk about boasting. Like, we'll get to all of them in just one moment. I want to get a whole list. So you would say the next one's greedy. Good. What would you say after greedy? Blesses. Blesses. Yeah, blesses is the one that I think a lot of us would miss, right? Greediness is something that I, we all recognize. But the idea of a covetous man blessing, how can that be a negative quality? He puts himself above other people. I and my money have ability to bless others for you doing the same things that I do. Bless you, son. You're just as greedy as I am. Uh oh. Right. We we normally think of blessings as something from God that He gives us unmerited favor. No, this blessing is a man who exalts himself and says, "I will bless and provide for you. You brood underneath me." So here he takes a very holy thing and makes it quite unholy. And the last verb, reviles the Lord. What is, that's not a word we use very often. Revile, rebel, that sort of thing. What, is that, what does that mean, to revile the Lord? What's, what's the picture of that? Mark? Rejects. Yeah, rejects. I reject you. Don't speak to me this way. I have my money. I am content. Yeah. Matthew, now, please. When revile. When I hear the word revile, I think of, I, like, reject, right? Like, being sick to my stomach and throwing up as if my body is rejecting whatever I put it into. Right? But, like, that's the imagery that I, I, that I would say. That revile. distance from God, I don't want anything to do with him. He just, he makes me sick to my stomach. Yes, John. The word revile, is the stem word not rebel? It, it, is that not the same word? The, like, the rebel and his glory, is that not? There, there is some similarities here. I apologize. I'm not quite sure of the Hebrew root. So I, I don't, I, I, you know, we think of an English cognate. I'm not quite sure the Hebrew root, the Hebrew picture of this exactly. In English, I think of, uh, of that. In, in, er, in Hebrew, I'm not quite sure. So I'm inclined to say I think so, but I, I, I'm, I'm qualifying that with saying I, I did not research that word and I... I apologize, but did, did you want to comment more on the assumption that it no, might be connected? I, no, I was okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair, a fair request. <laughs> so I apologize. I will research that and have that next week. I don't know if it's or not. I interpret um, reviling as despising. Yeah. There's an English connection there. I despise God because I got, I got money. And everybody admires me because I got money. I agree. Which one of the seven really jumped out to you? Blessing. Yeah. But aren't the rich and the greedy, aren't they exalted in our society? Right? Look at how intelligent this person or persons can be to amass this wealth. Um, look at the, uh, the way in which they, they can do this. Um, I read an argument, I won't name the magazine because it's normally quite good. I read an article about the, the founder of Uber, and he's kind of stepped down after some of his difficulties. But the, the article was praising this man's capriciousness in how he just, he, he defied laws, he defied regulations, he went in quick and broke stuff, was kind of his model. And how he, he did all of these things and then became very rich and powerful in this growing company. And then he had this attitude of looking at things and saying, I don't, I don't care if I put these people out of work. I don't care if I defy these municipal governments. I don't care if the European Union is suing me. I am greedy and powerful. And so then people were writing in this magazine, tell us, tell us, Travis, how we can make this kind of money. Tell us how we can be disruptors. So, so the man who breaks the law and is proud of it, and is greedy and, and rich because of it, that is the man encouraging the next generation at a business school engagement at the University of California, Berkeley. That is the man that they're saying, tell us how to be good business people. Break rules and just keep moving. 
So again, I'm not trying to pick on the magazine or the man of the company, but the mindset is what we see. Um, I can get away with it, and anyone who says differently, I despise you. <laughs> so blessing the greedy. Um, anything else that jumps out on, on these descriptions of a covetous man? Yes, sir. You know, we're talking earlier about Marcus Aurelius and uh, his book Meditations. Yes, sir. And I went back and read about him as being called the, the great emperor of Rome. And why was he great? Because he kept saying, enough is enough. Instead of conquering the world, he slowed it down and said, let's just be happy with what we got here, you know? Uh, and I think that all through all his meditations and writings, he delivered that. And, it was, uh, and it, he was talking about covet. He was. He, he identified the problem. He identified the downfall of the empire. Ovid did as well. They, they identified, if you're always covetous, you should never be happy. Right. Um, you know, humanly speaking, we can say when you try to take over German tribes, they come down and sack Rome. I mean, you can hurt, humanly look at that historically, but the... The fault of most nations, most people, there is no enough. I always need more. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. This is an uh, important section from the Apostle Paul speaking of his contentment in a very difficult situation. Um, if there's a misused passage in Scripture, it usually comes from Philippians chapter 4. Uh, but I'd like to see and, and try to help us understand how do we walk this fine line of contentment. In difficulty and yet maybe one more Paul says in Philippians I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry whether living in plenty or in want I can do everything through him who gives me Straight. Situation Paul is in when he writes a letter? Prison. In prison, yeah. And what is he facing? Yeah, he's facing execution. He's finally made his way through the, the process. You can read the book of Acts, so the various things, his meeting between Felix and other things like that. And he's getting to his process and he knows this is the end. He, he knows that I, I will get, as a, as a Roman citizen, I have the right to appeal all the way up. I have finally going to reach that. And like in our court system, you may have to wait a while to get to that hearing, but when you get that hearing, you will find out. Life or death. So, so he is in jail, he is near the end of his life, um, and he is facing the certain prospect of death. And um, if you read Philippians, his final letter, you certainly get that flavor that here's a man writing for the last time, ready for death. Right? And yet, a man writing for death, how does he speak? As if we look, at, if you can hold from flipping for a moment, how does he speak in jail, facing death? Under a weird man like Nero, who makes his horse part of his cabinet. How does this, how does he speak? Don't worry, you Even deeper than that, right? More than kind of a, a Timon and Pumbaa kind of a strategy. Uh, well, what, what does he say? That there, there, there's great deepness here, John. What would you say? Whatever you have, be content with what you have. Be content in all circumstances, whether this or that. And he's 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 been in these circumstances, right? Yeah, Aaron. When you were reading that, I was thinking what my dad used to tell me, and I used to hate it, but now I I, I always say it now too. It's <laughs> it's better than a sharp stick in the eye. You know, it's like, there could be a lot of worse things that are going on, you know, and I tell people, you know, I used to hate him saying that because I would be, I'd be upset about something. He's like, hey, it's better than a sharp stick in the eye. And I'd be, I'd be mad, and I'm like, oh, I, yeah, that's true. I can't, I mean, it could be worse. I could have a sharp stick in my eye. <laughs> I, I, think, I think many of us have had parental sayings we despised as children and teenagers, and now I think later on. Yes, sir. My father told me, he said, your dad will be stupid until you're 30. <laughs> and all of a sudden, when you turn 30, you'll wonder how I got so smart. <laughs> true about that. That's probably true. Yeah. Well, to get, to get smart. Oh, man. Smart. Yeah. I call my parents more often now for advice. Before, I was like, I don't need their help. Now, I was like, yeah, they're actually quite intelligent. 
Turns out they've always been. <laughs> the one who wasn't intelligent was, uh, yeah. And so, so what, what's the secret here? What is his real secret of contentment? Yes, B. He, he knows Christ is his savior and anything else is just there. Whether, whether you have a lot or whether you have a little, that's what's important. It, it's the most important that you have eternal life. I have Christ who always who provides me eternally, provides for me here. And provides what I need, not necessarily what I want. Absolutely, right? I've been shipwrecked, I've been stoned. Uh, the life of Paul as a, as a servant in the missionary journey is very interesting. He's been in some pretty tough spots. He's been jailed and earthquakes let him free. Yeah, no, I've, I've had some difficulties, but but no matter what, I've had the Lord, and the Lord has always taken care of me. And the Lord certainly will take care of me no matter what Nero does to me. Um, yeah. Luke, please. Thank you. This is one of those passages I struggle with. You hear that last sentence yeah. all the time. Yeah. And people almost use that part of scripture to covet. It's like I can be a CEO because God gives me the strength to do it. And, and you're using God as an excuse basically to call it. Yeah, this is, a, this is a difficult passage. One of my favorite NBA athletes writes this on his shoes. And he's, right. a, he's, a, he's a very God-fearing man, especially for NBA standards. A very God-fearing man, and yet here, well, God gave me strength to be MVP. No! No, Stefan, No! But here again, how we take God's word and, and twist it to fit my desires. God can give me strength to get through this because God is my only strength to survive and have goals on heaven. Um, there's a clothing line built on this passage. There are fortune companies built on this passage. This is welded into constitution and bylaws of Christian organizations. And all this idea that it, it, God can really make me achieve my goals. No, this man is not using it in this way. But my sinful world likes to grab a passage and say, aha, now God's given me energy to be rich. So I, I, believe me, I lament. I, it was a, it's a struggle for me to read this passage and not just complain about verse 13 when 11 and 12 are so rich. So I, right. I struggle with you at how this has been corrupted and, and misused very much. And, 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 the, and the, the rare of it, the, the mean of it, is quite wonderful. Yeah, I can, I can be in jail and face Nero. Nero. God will give me strength. I'll be fine. Death life. Rich poor. I'll be fine. I've gone through so much already. So yeah, um, trying to take this passage out of our American culture, that's hard for me to do. Jim, so it's almost twisted in a way to be God like the genie in the yeah. bottle. Yeah. God's my spiritual energizer to give me the goals and objectives I wanted. But that's how we often treat God, as someone to give me what I want. Yeah. Share it, please. In saying that, though, is it wrong to thank him daily in prayer for no. giving me the brains or the telling or the, the desire, not the desire, but the ability yeah. to take care of myself? And there's a difference. Because it comes from him. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. yeah. Thing, not, not a humble brag that we see here side. Thank you, Lord, that my book is 10th on the New York Times bestseller. That's a humble brag. That's a humble brag, right? Yeah. Um, no, a, a truth to say, thank you, Lord, that in spite of the situation, you have provided clothing and food. You have provided a place to stay. You have given me a future that is maybe uncertain here, but is certain here. Thank you for the talents that you give me that I can use to your glory. There, there is an overwhelming hymn of thankfulness that seems that smacks of Colossians too. Really, that is, that is an excellent example of that. Yeah. Let us do more of that. <laughs> Not humble brag. So thank you, thank you, Sharon. Yes, sir. That last part there says I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Yep. And then our human just jumps in and says, I know he's going to take care of me, but why don't they do it now? Yeah. <laughs> Strength yeah. now, right? Yeah. Providence now, in this manner, at this level. Yeah. Sometimes I have to wait on the Lord. The now generation, that's what we are. Well, we've, we've always been. It's just, it's, uh, it's just gotten progressively worse. Actually, it's a comfort because when we're facing a difficulty, we know God will get us through it. Maybe... 
it may not be a smooth ride, but we know whatever it is, God will take care of it. And and that's, even, even if we can't see a way through. And, and this is so important for younger people to hear, older people say this, for younger people, you know, the, the, the cross back and forth for people to say, I've been through a difficult part of my life and the Lord has always got me through. And as a, I, I remember so many times as a young person thinking, well, well, what, 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 and then older, wiser people would say, well, God has gotten me through quite a bit. He will get you through this. Maybe not in the smoothness you desire, but he will always provide. He always has for me. Um, and we need that kind of uh, encouragement and reflection, I think, because we can be too focused on now, not on what he has done and will do. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. I completely agree. Last passage for us. Oh, John, one more thought. Uh, God, God never gives you more. He knows yeah, well, he, he provides a way up when we are, as Scripture says, that I may feel overwhelmed, but he provides a way up. And, and sometimes, as we're going to see in our sermon today, sometimes you are just leveled low. Sometimes you are you are sitting in a valley in a depression and want to die. And, well, God is still there. He still provides his help for you. Sometimes it, it's rather humbling when he humbles me and I don't have the success I want, but God never abandons or forsakes his people. So... So yes, we have to be clear. Sometimes my life is very stressful. Sometimes he really puts a lot on me, but God is not a God of abandonment or forsaken. He is always one of, of providence and protection. And uh, what a great way to conclude that. Thanks, John, for putting me into our next passage. Hebrews 13, 5, last passage to look at. Be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. My motivation of covet is that I don't have enough. I need more to be happy. My motivation of content, God will never leave or forsake me. That is his inspired promise to me, no matter if no matter if you fill in the blank on what you have on your plate today. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. The best confirmation passage a pastor can assign. If you notice, I always do. Um, <laughs> for me, at least. Here's a passage we need to remember. So. We didn't get through our discussion. I really appreciate the commentary and the thought. And I will bring up some of this, as well as uh, John's good question next week, as I, as I conclude our study by teaching on the motivation behind the commandments. Today, Today, really, our motivation of trying to walk that fine line is thankfulness for the Lord, fighting the desires to covet, while still wanting to improve the talents He's given me and improve my way I serve of Him. Fine line to walk that we didn't get all the way through. We'll pick up a little bit of that next week. And also the ultimate goal of why does God give me commandments that He knows incite me to rebellion, <laughs> as Romans 7 said. Why does he say these things as we wrap up our study next week? I look forward to teaching that. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness and providence to us each and every day and the fact that you never abandon or forsake us. Help us in the struggles ahead of us today and this week to remember your providence and care. Help us to fight against the temptations to covet or to desire what we don't have or will not receive. Grow on us a contentment and appreciation, like Paul, that no matter our circumstances, we trust in your saving love and we trust in our eternal home. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.